My name is Tim Pataro. But what does that mean? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Means nothing. It's what you would call me in conversation, what you would refer to me. It's what my mother would say when she was mad at me. It's on my birth certificate. It basically just says a part of my identity. What I learned over the years is when you go through life and you experience different things, your identity is kind of a major role in how you see yourself and how others see you. It's interesting, you know, growing up in my neighborhood, everyone looked like me, talked like me, all the same food, same spots to hang out at. Wasn't very much uh, diversity where I was from. Everyone was pretty much Hispanic. And that's kind of the world I grew up in. And I didn't really experience anything different from that until I got older. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So in order to tell this accurately, let me go back to the beginning. So one day, my mom and my dad, just kidding. We're not going to go that back, though, well, that far. Here's what we're going to do. My story really begins, from what I remember, being about four years old, give or take. My parents got divorced. None of my memories with my parents were very happy, to say the least. Strike one, divorced family. A major inhibitor in someone's journey through life. One obstacle you have to get past. Some people do, some people don't. It's unfortunate, but it is the reality of the world we live in. So now I have divorced family, age four. So going through that, back and forth, visiting different uh, relatives, Christmas, the whole divorce life. Growing up, I didn't really, wasn't a very good student. In about third grade, I remember being in the back of the class. I had a notebook. And I was drawing Star Wars pictures. Just, you know, little planes and stuff and just in the bag doodling. And I remember looking up. My teacher's going over multiplications. And I looked down. Keep doodling. She left me alone. Didn't bother me once. The whole year was like that. To this day, my writing still sucks. I can still barely read cursive. And I still suck at math. But that's kind of a general theme of the story you'll hear. But I almost repeated third grade. Brought my parents in. And they said, uh, we think you're some drunk with your son. He's not all there. And my dad was like, no, you just need to apply himself. He's a work harder. You know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That was my dad. Hard work, 110, always forward. So after a conversation with the principal, I moved on and I went to fourth grade at a new school, fresh to start. My stepmom would help me with math by pulling out a jar of beans during dinner. And I would count beans to understand how math works to try and catch up. If you know any Hispanic people, it's uh, typical in our household. We use food to help motivate people, as you can tell. But I think it's important that my stepmother, who didn't graduate high school, knew the importance of education. She used to tell me, you're going to walk across that stage if I have to walk behind you and keep kicking you across the stage. You're gonna do it. You're gonna do what I couldn't do. You're gonna do it because we're here for you. We have support for you. That was the first lesson I learned about support and going through education with my stepmom. We're here to support you the best way we can. My dad would typically work 12, 14, 16 hour days working air conditioning. He'd be up, I'd hear him in the morning, still dark outside, roll out of bed, hear his truck oh, pull away and come back late at night go in the microwave because it was very loud, the door, and warm up his food and eat the dinner. And I was already in bed. That was like my typical childhood. So fast forward to eighth grade. I'm in the car one day. I'm with my family. Uh, my mom worked at an elementary school, and I walked to my uh, junior high. It was about, I don't know, 10 blocks or so. I don't know, I'm guessing. But I remember hearing the news where we're listening to radio and the guy says, ladies and gentlemen, a plane has hit the World Trade Center in New York. And I was like, what's the World Trade Center? <laughs> no idea what that is. Then I thought, and picture in my head, a little, a little Cessna, you know, accident, something like that. Didn't think much of it. So I get out, I eat breakfast, start walking home or walking to school. I get to my first period math class with Mr. Hart. I'll never forget that guy because I hated his class. And my buddy runs up to me and says, hey, you hear about that plane that hit the building in New York? I said, 
yeah, something about a Cessna or something. I don't know, some kind of plane. He goes, no, 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 the second plane. Two planes hit a building? He's like, yeah, something's happening. That's interesting. Okay. I still didn't think much of it. I go into class, bell rings, and Mr. Hart has a look on his face of just pure panic. And Mr. Hart was a very mean person. So I'm like, whoa, what scares Mr. Hart? And uh, he rolls out this TV, big box TV on wheels. We thought, oh, cool, we're having a movie. Wait, it's math class. That doesn't make any sense. What are we doing? Turns on the news. It's the 9-11 events, the World Trade Center, all that. I watched that probably about a week straight in school, every class, until the class let out. I went home, and my mom watched it on TV. Very important moment in my life. I knew the world was going to change. So, you know, I always tell people, my generation, we watched that live on TV and we were still children. You probably shouldn't have had that going on in schools, but probably, you know, it wasn't good for our mental well-being. But we saw that for about a week every day, nonstop, which is bad. But what happened after was way worse. The week after that, I remember my mom really panicking, my stepmom, sorry, I have two moms, my stepmother and my stepbrother. uh, He was like 17-ish, I think, at the time or something like that. Uh, She was worried that he was going to get drafted in the army or something, panicking. What are we going to do? What's going to happen? I had a good friend, John. He was uh, Iranian. They were Coptic Christians. His mom worked with my mom at the elementary school. I remember him and his little sister were scared to death. The government was going to come in the middle of the night and take them and put them in an internment camp. I couldn't imagine like going to school every day, expected to do your studies, and then one day your parents are gone. That's just part of your reality. But it's a reality we live with, even to this day. People were scared to go to the park. People were scared to go to the mall. People were just afraid. I remember seeing on TV one time this uh, gentleman, I think he was in New York or maybe Atlanta or something. He was a a Sikh Muslim, or, uh, sorry, a Sikh. Sorry, they're from Hindu. He was a Sikh. And somebody accused him of being a Muslim. And he was beat to death on like a subway or something. And I remember thinking like, that's really crazy. Why would you do that? Like the anger to do that to someone you have no idea who this person is. And it turns out he's not in the same religion. That anger was something that I got to experience as a child growing up. So fast forward, graduate high school, and my cap and gown looking all snazzy. I did it. Just barely, but I did it. I graduated high school with like a 1.3 GPA. Basically, I showed up and I got a diploma. That's kind of how my school worked. There were lucky people showed up to that school. I didn't know anything. To pass my high school, I had to take general math and horticulture. Horticulture is basically dig a hole, put a plant, and if it doesn't die, you get an A. Well, I go to a Hispanic school, so that makes sense. We're all going to be gardeners, right? Makes sense according to my teachers. And then general math was <laughs> the last year they actually required that. The next year they required uh, algebra. So I left high school with essentially like a seventh, eighth grade understanding of math, if I'm lucky on a good day. So that was my you know, thrust into adulthood. What's the one thing on my mind? Just like every other millennial was 9-11. I remember how I felt, and now I was in a position to do something about it. So go down to the recruiting office. I say, sign me up. I want revenge. Let's do this. I go to MEPS. I go through the processing. I take x-rays of my chest. <laughs> Turns out my lungs are too small. They said, man, I'm surprised you didn't come out of breath, you know, walking up here. I'm like, I went to high school wrestling all four years. I'm out of breath. What are you talking about? I later found out they mixed up my charts with somebody else, and it was a female, so that's why my lungs were so much smaller compared to what they really are. But I didn't go in the military. That was disqualified. My friends did, though. That was 2006 during the Iraqi surge. That was the start of me losing friends and being unable to do anything about it. So... (laughs) I uh, figured, okay, well, I can't go in the Army. What else do I do? I don't know. 
I guess I'll go to community college because that makes sense. That's what you do, right? You go to high school and then you go to community college, and then you do something else. There was no guidance anywhere. It was just my options. So I go to my first community college and I walk in and say, uh, I want to go to school. And they said, okay, what do you want to take? And I was like, well, I like history. When I was a kid, I used to have the little green army men and all the tanks and stuff for it. And I would have them uh, all over the house and, you know, everything you could think of army men related. I had the toy guns, the Halloween. I was always a soldier, that kind of thing. I like history. I grew up watching the history channel. I didn't have, you know, comics or anything as a kid. I had the history channel and my family who were veterans. So I said, I like history. He said, cool. You're going to be a history major. Awesome. What does that mean? He goes, you get to pick classes. Here you go. Basically, they gave me a phone book with classes in it. And I said, um, can I take this class? No, full. Okay, full. This class? Okay, last spot. Okay, got that. Wait, waiting list? Okay, got that. That was my experience going to a community college where I was from back in 06. I went there for a few years. Couldn't do it because I just it wasn't fulfilling. I wasn't getting any help. I wasn't a very good student. If it wasn't history, I wasn't very good at it. And I realized that I really hated it. I was pretty much um, stubborn, I guess, if you think about it, when they're like, oh, we're going to take English class. Why? I'm going to be a history teacher. Why do I have to learn English classes? Like, why? It didn't make sense to me. No one explained it to me. So I dropped out. Dropout number one. Moved to Las Vegas. My sister was moving to Vegas with her, uh, at the time, boyfriend. And um, she said, hey, uh, if you want to get out of dad's house, you can move with us to Vegas, which was changing my mind like it blew my mind when she said that i was like wow that's pretty cool i have family in vegas it's a new experience like let's do it it's new and fresh start so i moved to vegas and uh couldn't find work wouldn't you know it the 2008 housing market crash happened and vegas is a tourist town so if there's no tourism and there's no people moving and coming and going the town basically turns into nothing and i remember working temp jobs because my brother-in-law uh, worked at a temp agency, he could give me some temporary work, you know, menial stuff. I remember standing in line around McDonald's and I was in this line around the corner for a McDonald's for a cashier position. And I thought, hey, I should be able to get this. I have some college. I I can count kind of, you know, I'm, I'm trustworthy. You know, I, I should be able to get qualified for this. I waited for three hours. And when I got to the front, he said, sorry, it's been filled. Have a nice day. Awesome. I said, uh, did you really fill it or you just, just not want me? He said, well, I'll be honest with you, man. He goes, uh, I need someone who can speak Spanish. And I was like, uh, okay. Well, I don't know Abba very well. And I was like, I get it. But it hit me. My second barrier is I don't speak Spanish. Then I started to develop like an imposter syndrome. See, in high school, I always tried to be with the cool kids from Mexico. They had an indication in their arm from the shots they got born, born there. You know, La Raza, Brown Pride, all that stuff. Waving the flag, all that stuff. I wanted to be that so bad. I spent my whole time in high school trying to be that. And they would just look at me and laugh like, you're not one of us. Which is a weird concept to me because I was like, well, we go to the same we live in the same area we had the same ethnicity background we eat the same food like we look the same more or less i'm a little lighter i guess sometimes but you know why don't i fit in with this and i realized that that wasn't me i had to find my own identity so after trying to find work that didn't work too well uh, my dad gives me a call and says hey um he worked in air conditioning. He goes, I have some side jobs this summer. If you want to make some money, come back down. We'll get you some money and, you know, figure it out. And I owed my sister rent because I couldn't find work. And I was using all my, whatever I could sell on my own and all that just to get, make rent, you know? And um, I was like, yeah, I could do that. So I got home, worked with my dad, made some money and uh, paid my sister back. And I was like, well, I can't find work up there. I might as well just stay here and go back to school, I guess. I mean, what else do you do? I don't know. I'll use the Pell Grant or something, you know? And um, I was looking at it, and I'm like, I really don't want to go back to school. I really didn't like it there the first time. 
and I saw an ad. I was on Google, old Google, not new Google. It's the Google you couldn't you know read your thoughts. This is the one where you're just leading ads on the side. And uh, I saw an ad for uh, the Navy, and I was like, huh, that sounds kind of cool. Being on a boat, you know, out in different oceans, maybe. My dad, my dad was Air Force, and he always told me if he could have swam, he would have joined the Navy, see the world, let him pay for your vacation. And I was like, well, hey, I could swim. I'm already one step ahead of my dad. I'll go do the Navy, right? So I get on the phone, and, and I'm like, you know, I remember there being a recruiting office, the mall down the street. Let me call them up. So I call the Army. There was the Army and the Marines next to each other in the mall, and I call the Army, and this guy goes, Staff Sergeant Richardson said, uh, Hey, I'm looking in the military, maybe the army, you know, how does this work? And he goes, all right, cool. You're going to bring all your stuff. Give me a list. Be here. Zero nine tomorrow morning. Don't be late. Dress appropriately. I'm sorry. What dress appropriately. Okay. I don't know what that means. Cool. And then I'm like, well, I take care of tomorrow morning at nine, but I'm bored at home right now. What do I do with my time? So Borrowed my dad's truck, went down to uh, the, another town where they have a Navy recruiting office and said, I uh, walked in and I said, hey, um, is this the Navy? And she goes, yeah, yeah, come on in. I said, hey, um, I saw one of your ads on Google, think about joining the Navy, see the world or something. I don't know. What can you do for me? She goes, okay, what do you want to do? And we're talking about career choices and stuff. And she goes, uh, okay, yeah, you sound great. Everything sounds good. You wrestled in high school. You're pretty fit. Cool. Um, we have a two-year wait list. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? She says, we have a two-year wait list to go to boot camp. And I'm like, you want me to wait around here for two more years? She's like, I'm sorry. She goes, the Marines are next door if you want to go there. And I was like, no, I'm good. And then she goes, oh, well, the Air Force is never here. Um, the Army is right there. I could walk you over there. I said, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. My grandfather served in Korea in the Army. So I always heard Army stories growing up and thinking, yeah, I could do that. You know, I watched History Channel as a kid. So I'm thinking like foxholes and throwing the grenade all dramatically and, you know, all that stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I could do that. I could be that guy. And uh, I go next door and I sit down and he goes, she's really pretty, huh? I said, who? He goes, the Navy recruiter. I said, oh, she's gorgeous. He goes, yeah, we don't got girls like that in the, in the Army, but we can get you in the Army sooner than two years. And I was like, oh, a weird way to phrase that but okay sounds good sign me up let's do this let's put some information then gets a phone call hello let's put him on the phone i'm sorry what put him on the phone it's for you who's calling me at the army recruiting station hello i thought i told you to be here tomorrow at zero nine with your paperwork dressed appropriately what part of that didn't you understand and i'm like but i'm bored right now he says, I don't care. Be here tomorrow at nine. Okay. I give him the phone back. He goes, are you serious? And the guy goes, he'll be here tomorrow at nine. Let him, let him leave. And I'm like, man, this guy sucks. This is my first experience of army discipline. <laughs> Wasn't the last, but that was definitely my first experience. So I go next, the next day I walk in the door and I'm here. It's nine. I'm not late. He goes, I thought I said dress appropriately. I said, I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt. What, what are you talking about? What does that mean? He goes, if you're going to be in the army, you have to rise to our standard. I don't want to ever see you looking like a slob again. I'm not even in the army yet. You're already yelling at me. Are you serious? This is not the way to get me to join. But apparently it is because I joined anyway. So <laughs> I was like, well, hey, we're not doing anything else. The economy sucks. We're at war. I need to fill my patriotic duty and all that stuff. So he goes, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I just want to get revenge for 9-11. Changed my life. I've lost friends. He goes, you should be infantry. Luckily, I'm smarter than the average person because I'm like, yeah, that sounds awful. I don't want to do that at all. He goes, okay, what about being a military police officer? It's like being infantry, but you're on a truck and you get all these guns and you're just like, get some. It's awesome. And I'm like, that sounds awesome. Show me this really cool video of these guys on ropes and they're sliding in the window SWAT team style. And I'm like, Oh yeah, that's me right there. Spoiler. It was not me. Not at all. So, uh, <laughs> I signed up, get ready to go. And my dad buys a, 
a case of uh, MGD Gold. I'll never forget it. You know, the fancy beer, champagne of beers. And we're sitting in my front yard. All my uncles and grandfather, and my dad, and all veterans give me advice. Do this. Don't do this. Don't volunteer. Don't be last. Don't be first. Be in the middle. You know, listen. Stop talking. Listen. Don't ever say your opinion. Be careful. Don't volunteer information. Yada, yada. I just turned 21. And I found out something really funny. As soon as I turned 21, beer started tasting bad. <laughs> it's kind of funny. When you're underage, you're just like, yeah, party, you know. But uh, I was like, this is pretty gross. I don't like this. So I would run in the room in the kitchen where my mom was cooking and say, mom, I don't want this beer. It's gross. Can you drink it? And she would drink the beer for me, but I'd come back out with like, you know, a little bit left and then, you know, drink it and yay, we're having fun, family. And my dad's like, oh, you need another beer. Here you go. Well, <laughs> the fourth time I did this to go run into use the restroom, my mom's like drunk already trying to cook. <laughs> and she's like, someone else drink this. I'm getting buzzed. I can't do this. I can't do this. And my dad's like, are you not drinking the beer? And I was like, I don't really like it. And he goes, well, you will when you get in the army. And I'm like, what, is, what does that mean? That's kind of weird. So fast forward to boot camp. I'm at Missouri. I've never been to Missouri. Never been past Utah. I'm stationed in Missouri, Fort Leonard, Missouri, going to military police boot camp. And it's the weirdest place I've ever been because I've never been anywhere really rural before. That was like my first taste of like, oh, there's nothing out there. It's just green. That's kind of weird. I saw bugs about this big. That was kind of weird. Never seen that before. Snakes, never seen a snake in my life. That was interesting. And I'm with people that have never met a Hispanic person before. Now, there were a couple of black guys in my high school, a couple of white guys, a couple of Asians. So like, I, I've seen them. I knew like what that meant. Like I went to Panda, like I knew like you know, Chinese food existed, you know, but these people like never even like heard of Mexicans. That was interesting. First day in boot camp after reception, drill sergeant goes, all right, form lines. If you are black, this line, you are white, this line, Asian, this line, Native American or tribal, this line. If you're a Hispanic or Latino or anything of the sort, congratulations, you're now white. You go in the white line, which was a very weird way to phrase that because I'm me and like the five other Hispanics are like, did he just call us white? <laughs> yeah, he did. Oh, okay. So I'm getting in line, sit there and just not talking, just okay. This guy turns around, really big guy from Ohio. He was easily had two feet on me. He was just lumberjack. He goes, you're in the wrong line there, boy. Uh, not according to that guy with the flat hat. According to him, I'm white. And he goes, <laughs> you'll never be white. Well, I wasn't trying to be, so we agree. I don't know. What do, you want me to say? what do you say to that? So I'm just like, yeah, okay, dude. Whatever. That was day one. After six months of hell in the police academy, we're graduating. And that night we're... Uh, <laughs> supposed to be asleep, but it's the night before graduation. No one's sleeping. And he comes over to me, same guy. He goes, you know, Patara, I never met a Mexican before, but uh, you're one of the good ones. Thanks. I don't know what that means. Is that good? It's good, right? It's good. Okay. It's good. Thanks. Appreciate it. Didn't know what that meant, but I guess we're good. It's weird. People who would normally not like each other have prejudices, have biases and not get along generally. They uh, they tend to get real close when someone's yelling at them and making them do push-ups. It's kind of a funny thing to see. You have people on different sides of Chicago that hate each other from different gangs and stuff, best friends. You have people who didn't get along from, you know, Tejanos from Texas and, you know, Northern California and Southern Californians. Didn't matter. We were all green. There was no prejudice there. There was no racism there. We were all the same color, all green, different forms of green. And they made sure to let you know that. So I found I got orders to Germany. That was interesting. I want to go to Japan. Well, I want to go to Afghanistan or Iraq, but I want to get stationed in Japan or Korea, somewhere cool, you know, something different, you know. But I got Germany, and I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I history channel. You know, sounds pretty awesome. This is castles or something. And uh, <laughs> I landed in Germany, and uh, I thought to myself on the plane right there, it was 13 hours. And I thought, you know, I just graduated boot camp. That's the first thing I've ever done on my own. I don't count high school because I just showed up, but I had to work towards my graduation of the police academy. 
that's the first thing in my life that was mine and mine alone. I will always have it. You can't take it away from me. I earned it. I earned my values tag. I earned that class ring. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into being a soldier. And then I was in Germany. I didn't have my family. My grandfather had just died on my dad's side. The girl I was uh, obsessed with, I guess, uh, didn't work out with us. So I was pretty heartbroken and a lot of emotions and stuff. And not a best way to start a new career when you're by yourself in a foreign country. <laughs> I got to my unit. It was an honor guard unit. And uh, it was pretty rough. I, that was my second dose of, uh, you know, imposter syndrome. I was a soldier. I passed boot camp. I got the uniform. I got the T-shirt. I'm there, right? But because I didn't have a patch on my shoulder saying I deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan, I was somehow dirt. I was less than dirt. I wasn't worth their time. They call them slick sleeves. Some people, even to this day as veterans, when you don't have a deployment patch or a deployment under your belt, you're not you're like an imposter. You're not real. You're not worth their time. But I was like, well, I'm sorry I didn't go to Iraq or Afghanistan in between boot camp and here. Like, how does that work? That doesn't even make any sense. Like, I didn't choose where I was going. I wasn't, like, afraid to go. I was like, send me. Let's go. I put in requests to go downrange, and they said no. I was in a non-deployable honor guard unit. We did drill and ceremony, salute battery. We did uh, funeral details, rifle salute, cannon salute, all that kind of stuff. And I was an MP working as a police officer, basically. And they pulled me off for different duties. So I didn't even do my job most of the time. I was stuck in a post office or in supply or doing random menial tasks. That's how the army works. You need somebody, I got someone. Go. Go private, I choose you, you know? So I'm doing my stuff, training, going through stuff. When I was in the army, we uh, we got Osama bin Laden. That was a really important day. I'll never forget that day. I woke up, I was doing PT. I found out we killed him. That was an interesting day. And then Benghazi happened when I was in the army. That was really important for me because I was so close. You know, Libya and Germany are right there. We could have gone. We could have done something. We were a full strength company. We have rifles. We're trained for this. Let's go. Nothing happened. It's all about my pay grade. So that's my second opportunity to miss out on serving my country in a meaningful way that I thought was impactful. So I got hurt. It was the Obama drawdown. They were kicking out everybody left and right. I got told you can stay in, finish your contract, and go home, or you can get a check and go home early. Well, I pretty much hate everybody here, and I hate all of you, so I'm going to go home early with a check. So I left with both birds up. You know what I mean? I was ready to go. I was done. Thanks for nothing. Thanks for ruining my life and robbing me of the chance to be what I thought I was meant to be. I'm sixth-generation veteran. Seventh generation American. That was my my goal. Have you seen Forrest Gump when Lieutenant Dan's saying his purpose was to die in battle like his family members before him? That was kind of my mindset. This was my big event. This was my Pearl Harbor. 9-11 was my Pearl Harbor. I was supposed to be there. And you robbed me of that. So I took the check, went home early, salty and angry. I've always wanted those like coming home, you know, type videos where you see them in the airport, everyone's like, yay, welcome home, and mom's crying and all that stuff. I wanted that, to feel like a soldier for once. Well, <laughs> Germany's 13 hours away. By the time I got over, you know, changed planes, changed into my uniform, shaved, got on another plane, got to California. By the time I got there, it was like 9 o'clock at night. My mom was asleep. She was like, I got work in the morning. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> it was my dad and my uncle. Air Force vet and Army vet. Pick me up, shook my hand, welcome home. I'll take it. Driving home, my dad goes, You hungry? Do you want anything? Like you've been eating schnitzel all year, you know? Like what do you, you know, what do you what do you want? And I was like, you know, I can go for some nachos, just typical like street vendor nachos on the corner from a guy out of his little van. Like, that sounds amazing. Let's do that. <laughs> I got these nachos, this place I always go to as a kid. And we're talking, small talk. I'm eating my nachos. I'm in uniform. It's like 10 o'clock at night in like the hood. 
And it's funny because uh, I was to that up to that point, I was like, man, I'm so glad I'm over that. I'm done with it. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to use my GI Bill. I'm going to make bank. It's going to be awesome. I'm going to get a really cool job. It's going to be great. I get back to my room, my old room. I get to my bed and uh, I take my uniform off and hang it up. And I stare at it. That's the last time I was ever going to wear my uniform when I was in. So I cried. I just sat there and what do I do now? Well, use my job, I guess, go back to school. So they said, yeah, you can go to any school you want. Any school? Yeah, up to UCLA, wherever you want to go. Well, that doesn't sound fun at all. I'm going to go to a nice private school that I went to on a field trip when I was a sophomore in high school. It's called University of Laverne. Very fancy private little school. I show up and I say, hey, um, I need to uh, I need to do uh, register for classes. How do I do that? Oh, you got to do a volunteer hours. You got to get a recommendation letter. You got to do um, a GPA assessment. You have to write an essay, like all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, who do I turn my, GI, my uh, D214 into? Oh, you're a veteran? Yes. Oh, come on in. You're good. You start next week. Oh, well, that was easy. Cool. This is good for something. Worst mistake I ever made. She goes, what classes do you want to take? I said, I don't know. I was a history person in my last college. Okay, pick one of these. I picked a junior level class preparing you for your benchmark to graduate with a bachelor's. I had been in school like two semesters, so I was like not prepared at all. So being lost in school, everyone there is way more wealthy than I am. There's like no veterans there. And everyone there looks down on me because I don't belong. Imposter syndrome. My teacher's talking about Vietnam one time, and he goes, we lost Vietnam. Um, I disagree. We won every mil military engagement, every battle. We pulled out on our own accord. I would call that a tie at least. You don't know what you're talking about. Sit down, stop interrupting my class. Well, you don't know what you're talking about. You're a history guy. You don't even know we, we didn't lose Vietnam. Stop interrupting my class. Sit down and shut up. You are a robot in the Army. You don't know what you're talking about. Stop talking. I said, you want to guess what they teach us in the army besides tactics, military history. I think I would understand if we lost Vietnam or not. He says, stop it after my class or you're going to fail. I don't need this. I get up. I'm walking away. The rows were kind of like this, where like my desk is here. I got up to leave. I had to go this way. He comes around the class, gets in front of me and says, turn around and sit down. I said, get out of my way. Or I'm putting you through a wall. Remember, I just got out of the Army three months prior. I was pretty salty, pretty angry. Definitely had anger issues. Luckily for both of us, because I didn't feel like going to jail that day, a football player gets up, grabs him, and moves him for me. And I left. I went to my counselor and said, hey, this dude got in my face. This is inappropriate. What the heck? Do something about it. Well, have you tried talking to the dean? He is the dean. Well, have you tried apologizing? Why would I apologize? He got in my face. We well, should go apologize. You know, how about I don't come back here? How about that? Dropout number two. I go back to my old community college. Now there's a nice veteran center to go to. I'm with my people, right? Taking some classes here or there. I'm still kind of missing the army for some weird reason. And I'm like, man, this really sucks. This is a weird place to be. I'm just, I'm always in the veteran center. I'm not leaving the veteran center because I wanted to not feel like a fish out of water. One day, this guy comes to the desk of mine and I have my headphones on. He taps on the desk real loud. Hey, you need to go. I'm sorry. Are you closing? What, what do you mean? You're not a real veteran. I saw your D214. You didn't deploy. You don't belong here. You need to go. I'm sorry. Come again? What are you talking about? I'm trying to write a paper for English or something. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you're not a real vet. You need to go. You're fake. I'm like, Wait. So according to you, a real vet is someone who deployed to combat. He says, yes. I says, that means we would have to be constantly be at war to have veterans. That doesn't make any sense. What are you talking about, dude? That means my dad wouldn't be a vet. My uncle wouldn't have been a vet. All the Cold War vets wouldn't have been a vet. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. That's stupid. It's a dumb way to look at it. He says, I don't care. You need to go. Get out. The veteran club... Same way. I try to join them. They're like, oh, sorry, all the officers are combat vets. You don't, you don't really fit in here. American Legion Post, which is designed for peacetime and wartime vets, 
would not take me because they were run by the same people. You're not a real vet. <laughs> Great. The one thing I have under my belt that I actually did, I can't even claim it. So I'm not brown enough and I'm not military enough. Awesome. We're going, adulting's great to me right now. We're doing good. I dropped out. I'd say technically number two, but I guess it's number three, technically. So I went back to Vegas, moved to my sister again, and I started working in politics because that's the only other thing I really liked besides history was politics. And I'm going through and I'm saying, all right, you know, how do I get involved doing all kinds of protests and stuff with veterans rights and homeless vets and stuff like that. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I got the idea to run for Congress one day. I thought that'd be a great idea. You know, spoiler alert, it wasn't, but uh, I thought that was gonna be great. I'm gonna be a Congressman. Look at me. Yeah. Okay. I, uh, I'm writing a speech and there's a shooting happening at the MGM grand. There's a country concert going on and some guys shooting from the uh, upper floors. I saw that live on TV, a second historical event for me, again, watching on TV. And I knew the world was going to change because I was like, man, what is going on? This world's falling apart. And I said, you know what? Screw it. I got my GI Bill left. I'm going to use it. I'm going to become an officer, go back in the army, and I'll die in Afghanistan or something. That's fine. I don't care. I need to fulfill my purpose. That is my purpose to be a soldier. So <laughs> I dropped out of my race. I knew I wasn't going to win. And I moved here to sunny Arizona, specifically Paulden, Arizona. Yeah, Paulden. I thought Missouri was rural. Oh, man, Paulden was rural. I was like, there is literally nothing here. Wow, but the rent's good, so, you know, we're good. And I look up schools, and I see Ember Riddle. I go to Ember Riddle and say, hey, I want to be an officer in the Army. I need a bachelor's degree. I have a GI Bill thinking I can go to any school I want, right, just like in California. I show up, and they're like, um, your GPS is too low. You're not, you know, you're not at our standard. Go to YC and go do a semester and come back. What's a YC? It's Yavapai College. Oh, okay. Uh, community college? Cool. Yeah, that's fine. Like, makes sense. So I show up here. Uh, Ma'am, where's the veteran stuff at? She was, oh, at that time, she was upstairs. Talk to Scott. Cool. I go meet Scott Nardo. Signs me up. No problems. Real smooth. He goes, hey, um, you mentioned you had trouble in your past. You should sign up for uh, you know, SS Trio and do the services there for tutoring and stuff. I said, oh, okay, cool. I like that. Let's do that. I decided I wanted to be back in the Army so bad, I was going to stop screwing around, focus on school, give it 110%, which is a weird concept that I probably should have done back in high school. So I lived in the tutoring center here at OIC. I was here until 9 o'clock every day between classes, always doing tutoring. I would drive home to Paulden half hour later, grab something to eat. At 10 o'clock, I would go on Zoom with tutors that I had just gotten talking to, pay them out of pocket, and work on more math and science because that's how much I sucked at math and science. That's how far I was behind. I put my blood, sweat, and tears into my associate's degree. And to this day, I will tell you, it's the hardest degree I've ever obtained. The hardest thing I've ever done was having the strength to keep going through to get my associates because I really hated it. I was like, I don't care about poetry. I don't care about the clouds. Why do I have to do this? This is stupid. I just want to teach history. That's all I want to do. Why is it so hard? Well, COVID happens. So that was fun. I got to play the distance COVID game and doing all that. And I thought, you know what? It's fine. I'll just Zoom all my tutoring. I'll just like, you know, be in my house. But in my mind, I'm, in, I'm at YC. And then one day I was done classes and I got a funny skinny thing in the mail. And I'm like, the heck is this? I open it up. It's my diploma, my associate's degree. And I was like, wow. I did it. I'm a college graduate. None of my family has that. And it was weird because I thought, this is just like what I graduated boot camp. I earned this. I did it. No one else did it for me. I did this. And that's when it clicked. Huh. Maybe my mom and dad were onto something. You just do all the work and show up to class, they pass you. It's a weird concept, I know. But, you know, just being there and doing everything, that's how you get decent grades. I'll give you one better. I was an honor student when I graduated. I went from a 1.3 GPA in high school to an honor student in college. Could you imagine that, that was very weird. Again or something? So, I was like, hey, what's, what's my next step? I'm in Baruta, right? 
So I've been in a row, they're like, well, we'll talk to a counselor, let you know, we're not sure. I don't know what they're dealing with. And I was like, you know what, I don't know what's happening. Well, I was going to, um, you know, class like I was my last semester, and GCU had asked me, hey, you know, make us your plan B. Could you help? You know, we could have you as our, um, we could have you as plan B, come over to GCU. So I ended up doing doing that. They said you graduate with a sociology degree, bachelor's in 1.5 years. Sounds good, I'm back in the Army in two years, let's do it. Turns out I'm really bad at statistics, that's math. You can't change my mind otherwise, it's still math. So I changed my major history again, graduating two years. My last month of graduating, I was about to graduate, I uh, found out I couldn't go back in the Army. My back was hurt, I was, uh, had a bad disc in my back. I found out my dream of being back in the Army wasn't gonna happen. And I thought, well, I don't know what else I'm supposed to be doing, because that was my plan. That was my motivation to go to school. What else do I do? Well, I still like impacting people and teaching people things. So I thought I could be a college professor if I got a master's degree. So I worked with a program for the VA and got them to fund my master's degree in public administration with an emphasis in government and policy. Thinking, okay, it's government, I have history, these are two things I like, I can do them further well. Well, I'm here at this point in my life where now to today, I am now Tim Batar, first generation coordinator here at YC yeah, by College. I have past experience in teaching and I have past experience in other career fields. But I did understand something about myself. I understood what I was bad at and how to overcome it with the help of YC. So I stand for you today. In five weeks, I'll have my master's degree. And then I'll be taking my executive uh, doctoral certificate in history from Leadership University starting in January. And I could have done that without understanding my own weaknesses, my own struggles, my own need to get help and ask for help if I didn't come to YC. And that's why I work here. And that's why I tell everybody I can to the top of the you know, rooftops, this is how you get ahead. You get help. You ask for help. You keep on with the struggle and you keep going through. Because if you don't do that, that's when you don't make it and you quit. And I can tell you, as a three-time college dropout, keep going. You can do it. And I'm here to tell you, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Thank you so much. Thank you.